As generative AI and other advanced tools get better at writing new content, will we soon be heading down the path of not knowing whether anything that we read has any true value? Get ready for the onslaught of even more junk content courtesy of artificial intelligence. We'll chat about what's coming on this episode of Today in Tech. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Today in Tech. I'm Keith Shaw. Joining me on the show today is Alex Fink. He is the founder and CEO of OtherWeb, an online news aggregation app. Welcome to the show, Alex. Thank you for having me. All right. So uh, do, do people get offended by the term junk content or is that is that kind of what what is now is it just uh, something that i made up like well it's something that i made up oh, okay but in general i don't think people get offended it's just they get somewhat confused because they're used to hearing fake news misinformation and all these other terms but i think junk is a more precise one okay so long before we're going to go back in history we're going to jump on our little time machine and go back um the concept of, of junk content is not really new uh it's been it's been around i think you did some research and, and you sent me this this long document that shows some some really cool stuff um I, I mean let's go all the way back to medieval times right give us a a, a quick ish history of junk content well i think it mostly starts with the invention of the printing press because before that you only had one publisher. Right. And then from that moment on, suddenly you start seeing books that aren't printed because somebody wants to share information with the world. They're printed because somebody wants to sell some books. Right. And so going back to the 15th and 16th century, you see hundreds of books written about witchcraft and how witches are everywhere lur lurking in every corner. And one of those books actually essentially launched the witch craze of the 16th and 17th century okay. and caused the death of 80,000 people. Right? You see hundreds of books about how to turn lead into gold, alchemy, essentially. Right? In Eastern Europe in the 19th century, you see a whole bunch of books about how Jews are secret re secretly luring, uh, ruling the world. Mm -hmm. right? And probably the most famous one is the Protocol of the Elders of Zion. But that's actually the last one in a series of books by some authors over 40 years, right? And that launched most of the pogroms in Eastern Europe. Mm, okay. right? And then we switched to newspapers around the late 19th century uh, because that's when essentially the daily newspaper and the yellow press were invented. Right. right? And you start seeing these special, special read all about it. Right. I think kind there's, of, the, yeah, we've got a couple yeah. of pictures there. Of, the, yep. of some of these headlines. Yeah, again, yeah. writing headlines was always intended to to sell newspapers. Yeah. Um, right. And, and but, even when I was working for newspapers in the, the 80s and 90s, it was an art mm -hmm. form of, of writing a headline that might get someone to pick up the paper and buy it. It necessarily, it, sometimes you, you, you would think, oh, it's, it, it's, it summarizes the story. It's like, no, you're, you're there to have the headline to get, um, get someone to read the paper. And then that, yeah, that but, transformed into clickbait, right? Right. Well, so in some sense, those newspapers of the late 19th century, early 20th century, they had one clickbait he headline, or what we would today call clickbait, but then the rest that was packaged underneath was still good journalism. Yeah. Right. And then you get to the late 90s, and suddenly, with the internet, every article has to fend for itself. There is no issue that packages things together anymore. And so now every article needs a clickbait headline, and you have a whole bunch of outlets out there that are actually testing 15 different headlines to see which one has better click through before deciding which one to go with. And then it definitely doesn't summarize the body of the article anymore. Yeah. And, and, and you even see this not on just on online news articles. You see this in, in YouTube, for example, right? Like right. If, if for, for the, whatever the, I see, I haven't decided yet what headline to write for this, for this particular episode, but mm -hmm. when we do thumbnail, uh, thumbnail images, I have to pick headlines that are shorter than the ones that are on the, the actually description of the, of the episode. And sometimes I, I kind of fall into that clickbaity type, type headline, just because right. again, people looking at this only have like three or four seconds to decide whether or not they're going to click it to, to watch the video. So you see that all over YouTube too, right? Yeah, it's all over YouTube. It's all over every single media. Podcasters do this. In fact, the good ones talk about it openly. I think Chris Williamson mentioned several times that he always tests multiple names for the podcast. Otherwise, how does he know if it's going to work? Right. right. So it's Ma kind of imagine the rules if we of the had game time, right now. Yeah, Chris, imagine if we had time to do 20 different thumbnails for each episode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it's the benefit of doing just that for a living, right? Oh, well, yeah, we have to do some other things here uh, as well. Um, now, now you also, so, you know, when did, when did the, when did the body part 
of uh, online articles, when did that start becoming junky as well? Because sometimes I'll read an article and it just be like, this didn't tell me anything. Like if I was looking for research or background or just to learn more about a subject, they, they just get filled with, is, is this a result of the SEO movement and, you know, just junky words that are in there? That, that, so that, SEO is certainly article. a part of it. Yeah. If I had to pick one origin point for this trend that we're observing right now, it's probably the acquisition of AdSense by Google in 2003. Okay. Because from that moment on, not only were we able to track SEO, but we were, began to track the performance of every single ad, every single click, every single impression, essentially. And now you have the selective pressure on all content to basically generate clicks and views. Right? So you have an evolution of content towards clickbait. And yes, it affects the body of the article. It affects the selection of what people are writing to begin with, right? And outlets end up writing things you really don't expect them to write about, right? When CNN has headlines like "Stop what you're doing and watch this elephant play with bubbles," <laughs> clearly that's not a news story, but it's in their news section. And just to make sure that we know how proud they are of the story, they tweeted about it. They actually placed it in their RSS feed, so I saw that article on Google News not on CNN initially, right? So it's everywhere because that's how they get the clicks in. Yeah, I think the, one of the uh, one of the CNN ones you sent me was 14-year-old girl stabbed her little sister 40 times. Police say the reason why will shock you. Like that that yes. whole sentence is is like you should just know that that's clickbait, right? Or, or that's just yes. meant to get you to click the thing to, to, to read the story. But um, they got 700 retweet, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't realize. Yeah, in fact, I, I i mean, I know it's true, but I never realized that there's an association between you get the junk story, but then that gets perpetuated across social media, too. Yeah. Stop what you're doing and watch this elephant play with bubbles. Unbelievable. <laughs> or how the most vicious, horrible animal alive became a YouTube star. That's the New York Times. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You, didn't you send me a Forbes one? I think we've got the Forbes one up too, like the protein powder. Yeah, so like, Forbes, the, they, they have a few things. And they're a weird case study because they are paywalled pretty heavily. And so they end up luring people in, but then people can't even read the article for the most part. All they see is a headline and a paywall, right? But with Forbes, I had them rank protein powders. And that one actually ranks number two. If you just search best protein powder on Google, the Forbes one is number two on the list. The th number three is lifescience.com. Yeah, so most of those one. articles are done just so that they can get higher up in the Google rankings, right? I think it's actually monetizing the fact that well, they are already yeah. high up in the Google rankings. So yeah, through right? affiliate, so, uh, affiliate marketing and affiliate links, then they yeah. get money if you buy the protein powder yeah. from that link. Yeah. If you decide, and oh, well, I trust and Forbes, And possibly right? selling more subscriptions. Yeah. Uh, so if Forbes has a paywall, it doesn't matter how you, they get you in the door, you're going to see that paywall pop up. There's a chance you're going to buy. Well, who's the worst offender when you, when you see a lot of these, these articles? Are they just sites I've never heard of? Well, they are certainly bad because they have no standard whatsoever, right? And so if you go to the Daily Mail, it's obviously going to be much worse than the New York Times or Forbes. But then once you go beyond that, it startles all the way down. There is this entire industry of websites that only exist for SEO purposes. And you can just buy an article there that will be written by probably AI, maybe some contractors on Upwork, but for the most part, I'm pretty sure it's just AI generated. And you can buy a backlink for 20 bucks. They will write an article about you on any topic that you specify. They will link to your website. And it actually ranks pretty well. Some of those websites have domain authority of 80 and up. Okay. Is that like the stuff that you see at the bottom of some of these article, uh, uh, some of these news pages, where it's like the Outbrain links and the, the Zergnet, I think is one of them. Are those yeah, what you're and, talking about or is that something different? It's something different. So yeah. you're talking about Outbrain, Taboola, and all of those advertising services that yeah. masquerade as articles, but they're really ads. Right. right. I'm talking about things that are actually written as articles okay. for a publication that is entirely fake right. and just exists to accumulate SEO juice, essentially. Okay. Yeah, you mentioned the Daily Mail. I think you've got, you know, you, you sent me a, a bunch of different things with the Daily Mail. What, yeah. what, what, what annoys me most about the Daily Mail is like the, the headline is is longer probably than the story itself it's like can you yeah. tell what this german person is laughing at scientists say people from all cultures can detect the emotions behind these chuckles so can you defy cipher these giggles yeah. yeah and that is the science section you should see the <laughs> entertainment section <laughs>
All right. So, so we know that this stuff is out there. Um, and so uh, a lot of this content was written manually before we get to the generative AI stuff, right? So right. Um, you would have people that, that their job is to just write this, this junky content, right? Yeah, and many of them were paid by the word, and typically their output would be something like 10 or 15 clickbait articles per day, and then they're topped out. They can't produce any more words in a day than that. All right, and so I think I know where this is going. So now now we've got generative AI and chat GPT, and so um, how is that going to change the game, or has have you already seen it starting to happen well, yet? We're definitely seeing it, right? Um, I actually mentioned uh, to you when we spoke before that a company I used to work for, if I go to their corporate website now, it is one of those SEO juice content mills, essentially, and I can buy an article to be posted there. But when I actually mapped the articles that currently appear on that website, I saw more than 300 articles all posted on the same day by the same person. That's yep. basically the entire content of the, of the website. There is no way that person could do that without generative AI. Okay. So clearly it's already being used and it's sort of going from the bottom up. And right now it's probably being used by the SEO mills. Then it will be used by the Daily Mail, and eventually it will end up. Well, it already ended up on CNET and a few other publications, right? <laughs> so, so will yeah. So as these as these articles get created and they get fed into the engine, that doesn't that spell doom for um, SEO based Google research or Google links, and and maybe that's the problem that Google is going to have in the future is that they won't be able to determine whether something is good content or not good content, or are they just going to have to go to the, mm. the trusted sites and, and yeah, rank them I, I higher? I think the problem will be passed forward by Google to the actual content creators. And so the first thing you're going to see is margin compression for everybody, because now they're competing with a free product. Mm. right? And since most consumers can't tell the difference, and Google can't tell the difference, then somebody who's actually investing in investigative journalism or the effort it takes to produce good, good quality articles is going to see their revenue just go down and down and down and down. Well, that's Google, that, that's helpful I think, for the rest of us that are still trying to produce good content. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Thanks, it, it, Alex. it's not going to be easy. <laughs> this I might be my final that, interview. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me continue on this doomsday path for a little okay, longer. Okay, great, sure. Um, I think one of the other things you're seeing is that the combination of search and generative AI, something we call a retrieval augmented generation or RAG, allows somebody like Google or even somebody that is third party using Google API to now just answer a search query without giving you any links. Right? So you're asking what is the best protein powder? Nobody said Google has to send you to an article on Forbes or somewhere else. They could just tell you the answer. In right. which case you clicked nothing and none of the people that wrote the content get anything. And so I think we're going to see more and more of that, which means the total number of clicks to go around is also going to diminish. Well, isn't that isn't that going to be Something where the the user is going to have to trust that the AI is telling you what the best protein powder is. Um, they are, but it know, can also to include explain, references. Like, why, did you, so, why did you pick this yeah. brand over this brand? And um, yeah. I mean, I, I, guess I mean, it, it could include powder. the references if you want to go and check for them, but most people just won't, right? Or right. maybe they will do it once to see that okay, the answer made sense, and so they will trust the next answer. I think I'm guilty of that a little bit when I'm when I'm, I'm starting to do Google searches, and I will just read whatever the AI is telling me, um, mm -hmm. rather than than go underneath because Google is still, you know, you type it in Google, and it's like here's the generative AI results, and then you go down, um, and then you'll see the ones that actually have articles, and sometimes they connect, um, but for the most part, again, whatever's whatever's at the top is what most people are going to read, right? Yeah, and so and yeah, that's really bad news. Um, so and, and you have to consider also that it's not like those results were trustworthy before AI got involved. Sure. Right. So for the most part, if you search best anything and then insert name of product, then the results you got were primarily sponsored. And so it's not like somebody did an actual review anyway. You were already getting whoever paid the most money to be placed there. And so if now AI is going to summarize that for you, the quality of the answer you're getting did not go down. It just became more concise. Okay. Well, that's depressing. <laughs> um, so, so how can readers, uh, you know, how can readers and general consumers, how, how can they tell whether an article is, is good or, or junk content? Is it, is it that they just have to trust the, the brand that they're, 
that whatever site is that it's a real site or it's a real or it's an old news site you know it's wall street journal new york times you know idg whatever you know i have to give a plug for our own company um computer world you know that that at least you'll know that there are some human beings behind it and we're and we're not trying to produce junk content but again you say that that's already slipping into sites like cnn and stuff yeah it it is so i'll give you a three-level answer okay level one Every reader can envision themselves an editor and basically do everything an editor does when somebody puts an article on their desk, right? Check the references, check the sources, check that the headline matches the body, check that the article doesn't make any claims that aren't actually substantiated by the evidence, etc. Mm-hmm. That's going to take much longer than reading the article and discarding it. Right. right. So level two is find some sort of heuristic. I trust this journalist. I don't trust anybody that I haven't heard of. That's what you mentioned, right? Right. And then level three is try to use some third party tools, maybe tools that use AI themselves, to help you automate the job of an editor, essentially, but on the consumer side. Okay. I'm not going to ask what kind of sites there are because I think you're going to tell me something that, of like one of your sites. <laughs> uh, all right. We'll just leave it at that. So, um, does generative AI created articles, does it make it harder to tell whether something is good or not or, or, or not? I don't know why I to wrote that extent, question. To some extent, yes, because one of the things that you could use as a proxy before is just grammatical errors. Yeah. And that's probably going away because generative AI helps fix that or eliminate that to begin with. And so now even bad writers who barely speak English can write relatively good English. And, and so this is no what we're seeing in yeah, pure language. Yeah, we're seeing this yeah. in the cybersecurity space, right? Where yeah. where the spam messages you used to get or the phishing emails you would get, you could always tell because it would be like, "Hey, help help send me money now." And and yeah. you know, now they're they're able to speak in complete sentences. Plus they've probably got data that that tries to target you, um, that they know something about you and try to make it like they're a real person. So you're starting to see that in the So the, the, is it more that AI generated content is becoming more and more like written by a human or can you still tell because it's boring and bland and, and the only way that humans will be able to kind of defeat this will be to have creative writing. Well, I, I, better I think it's creative. a combination of all of these. Yeah. Um, I would say that there is no general way to determine whether something has been, has been written by a human or by AI already because the AI we have is just trained on human generated text. So by definition, you can't tell the difference. Now, yes, it is unoriginal. It generally will not say anything you don't expect it to say. And so maybe that's one way to start suspecting that this has been written by AI. But you mentioned using this for cybersecurity purposes or how that makes the job harder. One of the odd things that I've noticed is that if I look at reviews that are blocked by the Android marketplace and by the App Store, one of the parameters they seem to be using right now, that's just a suspicion. I don't see what's under the hood. It seems like they use good English as a proxy for fake reviews because they assume real reviews actually have mistakes in them. <laughs> but anything that's written in perfect English is probably suspicious and fake. <laughs> so I'm not allowed. So because I am a, I'm a writer by trade, I, I shouldn't write reviews because people might think I was, it was created by an AI. Maybe or, or like so come up with should, some bad habits. Human like should don't start capitalize into, your sentences. Yeah, yeah. Like that. Human should start <laughs> writing p- more poor. See, now that, that that's not even correct. But you'll know it's a human yeah. because I can't say write poorly. Uh, yeah. Wow, I didn't even think about that from the um, uh, review side of things. Is that where you're seeing a lot of AI content just kind of filtering? I mean, those 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 have been a problem for a while too. Yeah, but yeah. obviously those are now getting automated because that's the lowest form of writing. So yes. <laughs> Imagine if I was making money doing any of that, but I'm not. So, uh, all right. So, all right. So there's a lot of doom and gloom here. So let's let's keep going and bring this down into the future. Um, are you also seeing with the rise of AI image generators, um, and now we're seeing potential AI video generators that you can base a video based on a prompt. Um, is this going to create even a more, uh, p- a bigger problem when it comes to news content? So now not only can I create a junk article, but now I can create a junk image to go along with that. Uh, before at least you would see photos that looked real. Uh, and you could say, okay, I think that's a real article because that image looks real. And then you read the article and, and hopefully it's, it's, it's real content. Um, but could you see that, that now generating, um, more and more problems as you see articles that have text and and images and potentially video that's now generated by AI. I think it's certainly going to require an adjustment from everybody because we're 
going into a world where if somebody shows you a photo, you just have to assume it's fake unless they showed you full chain of custody from the camera to what you're seeing right, right now. Right. Right. And you saw this with memes about, I want to say eight or nine years ago. Before that, if somebody showed you a meme and the face of a person and a quote, people just assumed it's true and the person actually said it. And then at some point around 2014, 15, 16, most of those became fake. And we just started to assume it's fake unless we actually heard that person say it on video. And now you have to assume that even if you hear it on video or an audio, it's just going to be false. We have an engineer in Pakistan and before their last election, like a day before the election, he was getting a robocall with the voice of Imran Khan telling him to boycott the election. Okay. And he was going to vote for Imran Khan. So, <laughs> so clearly you can no longer trust the voice of somebody you know telling you right. to do something I, I even forget, unless yeah, you have full chain of custody. I forgot about that, about the, the AI voice cloning uh, ability. Um, yep. Again, you could create a video of me talking about something and it was created by with this image and this, you know, having a discussion and I could just be saying some yep. idiotic things. Uh, mm -hmm. And then you embed that into a story that's also fake. And it just it yep. just come, it, it, it's, it's definitely a road that um, we need to, to to be worried about. Yeah. I think you mentioned the chain of custody example. Can you go a little bit more into details about that? Is that something that. Um, is that the only way to fix some of this? And would are, you know are, are publishers going to explore those paths, or is it is it just not something that they might be worried about? I, I think publishers will probably have to explore them, but they can't really do it alone because the reality is, if we talk about video for a second, right? Yeah. Audio is somewhat outside my area of expertise. But with video, the moment video became digital, there is no such thing as an unaltered image anymore. Mm -hmm. right? Because on camera, you're going to alter the image. That's what basically the entire hardware of the camera does. It's image processing. Right. right. So the only thing that you can do is figure out whether the image changed after it left the camera. And so if the camera manufacturer actually plays ball, and watermarks the image in some way, like let's say calculating a checksum of the video or the image as it left the camera, encrypting it in a way that cannot be faked, right? using asymmetric encryption. And then once it leaves, anybody who modifies the image in, a, in some way has to include the original, the, what their modification is, and an explanation of why they did it. Right. With that kind of chain of custody right there in the video file, if you receive this video file as a journalist, you will know whether you can trust it or not. And then if you publish it as a journalist, if I trust you, then I will trust the video file. That is essentially the only technical solution I can think of. Yeah, maybe there are smarter people than me who can come up with something else. But are you are you hearing whether camera manufacturers are going to go down that path, or maybe maybe Not for yet. news photography or news videography things like that? Or not yet. Yeah. But I expect it's going to happen because similar things have happened in other industries. So yeah, like you know that 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 made me think of what happened over the over the past weekend or you know recently with um, uh, Kate Middleton and the the whole uh, Photoshop thing that she was public. Yeah. You know they published a Mother's Day photo over there. I guess in the UK it was in it was last weekend. Uh, yeah. But then all these people were like, "No, this has been altered. This has been altered." Um, and then they she had to come out and say, "Oh yeah, it was it was altered because I was." pretending to edit the photo or anything like that. Yeah. And, and there's, again, there's a lot of conspiracy theorists out there who won't believe whether that was a legitimate photo or not. And in fact, all the new, yeah. the news agencies had to exit yeah. out and say, don't publish this. Of course, now that but means the, we're all publishing. The it. irony is that looking at that photo, the only thing that I see really edited is the left wrist of Pr Princess Charlotte. Yeah. Right. But now because they have done that, which was really stupid of them, obviously, yeah. everybody is going to start these conspiracy theories about how really that image came from a Vogue photo shoot three years ago. And maybe she's already dead. Right. I've actually read that on Twitter, I, which well, is that, where you read this kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, again, you go down that rabbit hole and, and you're like, I don't, I don't trust anything that anybody's going to say anymore. And, and, and it's the same thing that, that we've got an election coming up. That's going to just be, it's going to be nasty. And you, you know, I don't know what I'm going to do. Well, it's us and the rest of the world. I think there are 64 elections coming up this year. Oh, it's wow. more than half of the world's population voting. So it's going to be fun. All right, take me take me out of this this giant hole that we've dug ourselves into, Alex. <laughs> like again, without without what is again the solution you said was was this, but it just feels like that's a lot of work and a lot of money that I don't know if if publishers are going to go that route. It's just gonna they're just gonna try to have to say trust us 
and and then try to do a better job yeah, at this. Well, but they they can say trust us, but the question is, what do they trust? Right. 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 And so this is why you need the chain of custody before it gets to, let's say, the New York Times. Yeah. So that the New York Times knows that this is the video that was captured by this Canon SLR. Right. Because if it's been altered before it got to the New York Times, how can they publish it? Right. So this is why I think that kind of technical solution has to involve camera manufacturers and the actual format of images and videos that we use. But leaving that aside for a second, I think that the way out of the hole that we dug for ourselves is always going to be to fight technology with technology, right? Okay. Antiviruses are there to combat viruses. Right. Spam filters are there to combat spam. So if we have junk, we need something that de-junks what we consume. All right. So right? so yeah, in in the uh, image space, you know, there's been talk of watermarking and digital watermarking and things like that. And and so there are tools that that have come out that will detect whether an image, for example, has been generated by AI, and then mm-hmm. um, whether or not whether or not the publisher admits it in the in the caption. Uh, yeah. You know, for the most part, anytime we use one, we'll be like, "Yeah, this this image was generated by AI." But it's it's also it's also pretty obvious now. You start seeing a lot of these companies using you know AI images instead of stock images, because um, mm-hmm. again, they would all use stock images before. So you can now pretty much tell if something's been generated by AI. Um, it it but, will not but, last very long. But but are right. these digital watermarks or are they going to work, or is it only work if everybody does it? Yeah, it, it only works if everybody accepts it, accepts it as a standard. Yeah. It's not that everybody has to do it. It's that some subset of the industry has to say, this is the standard, we don't trust anything else. And then anybody who cares about quality follows that standard. And then there's always going to be a part of the internet that doesn't care. Yeah, And they just publish anything as long as it looks good. And some of it will be real, most of it will be fake. Is is all of this irrelevant anyway? Because most, most people, especially the younger generation, is just going to get their news from either Instagram or TikTok? <laughs> Maybe though I'm not sure. I think that trend is actually somewhat reversing right now. Oh, okay. Um, like the the last study that we did showed that only forty percent of Gen Zers get their news from social media right now as a primary source, and I think it used to be higher though. I I don't have the exact comparison. Oh, so there is hope. We, there is hope for the next generation. Yeah, there I, could be. It it could be that they just stopped con- consuming news altogether, but. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think the, you guys recently did a survey, and there was some right. interesting um, results from that survey. Um, oh, eighty nine percent of Americans wish they had an effective way to filter out low quality news articles. Um, so yep. that feels like there's going to be a technology solution for all of this. Yep. Um, and then eighty uh, percent of Americans recognize the importance of consuming a balanced diet of political news from both left and right leaning sources. Um, and over half admit to primarily consuming news that aligns with their own beliefs. Um, I'm yeah. surprised it's that low. I, I figured it was going to be like seventy or eighty percent that just pick pick one side and and, and get their views yeah. from that way. It actually varies by the primary news source. So if you look at radio or podcasts, it's 68, 69%. If you look at people who primarily consume news from news aggregators and print newspapers, it's 51, 53. So it varies a lot based on what the mode of consumption is. Yeah. I, and you also see a difference between generations too. I think Gen Zers are the one that care the least about a balanced diet mm-hmm. and do the most of consuming from just one side. Yeah, and then what the older the older generations are more likely to seek out different news sources and things like that. Well, again, if they are not radio people or podcast people, then yes. <laughs> if um, do you see this this do you see this depending on the type of news that is out there? Is it is it mainly political stuff where you see it? Is it is it entertainment news? Is it sports? Do you see this junk content happening all over the place, or is it more product reviewy type things? Like, or, you know, do you see it across the landscape, d- depending on the category of of the news you're looking at? So, for the numbers that you just cited, we yeah. only asked about political news. Okay, we did not ask about anything else. Now, well, we're no, no, seeing if you, junk if you, if everywhere. If you go back, like, yeah, if you see where the junk right. is coming from, is it does it ma- it doesn't matter what what news category it is, right? Yeah, it, it exists in all of them. In fact. I would say that most science journalism has been junk for a very long time. It's not like it's new in science that a study publishes one thing and it's not even that great of a study. And then all the articles about it will be sensationalized beyond belief. There was actually one that I saw about three days ago where 
the study essentially looked at correlation between consumption of diet soda and <laughs> cardiac, uh, what, do, what do they call it? Arterial fibrillation. And they saw that it increases by 20%, right? right. But right. the article, but the article talked about consuming diet soda increases your chance of arterial fibrillation. The reality is, it was just a cohort analysis, right? They were just looking at two existing uh, populations. There was no causality involved in the study. It was purely observational. And by that token, I can say that being an American doubles it, right? So a green card causes a hundred percent increase, not a twenty percent increase, <laughs> if you compare it to the rest of the world. Yeah. So obviously, you cannot write that if you're an actual science writer. But that article was from CNN, and so they didn't mind. <laughs> wow. I don't. I don't read a lot of science articles anyway. And I think my problem isn't the the diet soda that I drink; it's the ring ding I also have with it, <laughs> the, the chocolate at the end. Uh, all right, I, I'm try I try to end these episodes with some kind of optimism, Alex. So so give me give me one one hint of optimism. I think you already have with the the technology we'll be able to to solve this. But it, it, I mean, is it realistic to believe that this is going to get better, or is it going to get worse? Is it going to get worse before it gets better? I think it will get worse for a while because transition periods are always. Yeah painful. But if you look in the long run, well, the invention of the printing press caused a lot of junk for a while. Yeah. But ultimately, we're all smarter at the end of it. Right? Okay. And the same can be true of basically every new technology that came along, especially communication technology. So I think we will all be smarter a couple of decades from now. But during these couple of decades, we're going to live through a windstorm of junk. Okay. I, yeah, I, I like to think of the future as being able to do what they did in the Matrix, where they have a particular topic or news and, and, it, and it gets digitized, and then somehow we plug that into our, 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 the, the jacks that we have in our head, and then we'll become smarter. But I just hope that the content that they put in is actually really, really good content, so that I will be able to yeah. drive a motorcycle at some point. <laughs> yeah, and it will have to be a social process to some extent. So yeah. technology is always going to be a part of it. But ultimately, if you look at how peer review works in science, right? Obviously, there is some technological verification of the claim somebody makes in a study. But for the most part, you have an army of editors and peer reviewers, and information kind of percolates to the top, right? And still, some percentage of it is fake, but. For the most part, it has yeah, a higher but, signal yeah, to noise I mean, ratio the, the, than news. The problem in the news industry is that the that there's fewer and fewer editors and 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 people that can check all that content, and so you're you're just left of of here's the content, and then it usually has to be the the crowd that says that's fake or that's real, that's fake, that's real, that kind of stuff, and so, then and then so, you get into arguments, but like, well, no, that's not fake, and you know that's why we I have agree. a lot so of these. We just have people. to give the crowd some better tools to actually okay. make the good stuff rise to the top because right now the more clickable stuff rises to the top instead. Right. <laughs> and I hope that I I don't know if I'm going to use clickbait on this, but if you do, I'm sorry. I just <laughs> I need the clicks. All right, Alex, uh thanks again for for joining us on this great conversation and hopefully things will get better out in the world of of news aggregation and things like that. Thank you so much, Keith. All right. That's all the time we have for today's episode. Don't forget to like the video, subscribe to the channel, add any comments that you have below. Join us every week for new episodes of Today in Tech. I'm Keith Shaw. Thanks for watching.